Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the college admissions process podcast. I am your host, John Durante. And I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions, regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given podcast episode You should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the College Admissions Process Podcast, everyone. This is John Durante, your proud host, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you today to Lori Wax. She is the New York Metro Regional Recruiter for Penn State University. Lori, how are you today? Good. So nice to be here, John. Thank you for having me. Always excited to talk about Penn State and the college process. We're so glad to have you here, and I'm looking forward to hear more about Penn State University. Thank you again. So, Lori, why don't we start by asking you to just tell us about yourself as it relates to being a college admissions representative. Uh, So I came into college admissions a little bit late. It's kind of a second career for me. I had worked uh, prior to that. I'd worked in broadcasting. I took some time off to raise my own children. Uh, During that time, I was very involved in educational foundations as a volunteer. I was a volunteer for my own college alma mater, doing uh, alumni interviews and attending a few college fairs for them. Um, And then I, I really became very passionate about higher education and access and just the the process and and learning about it. And I ended up working for uh, getting a job for UMass Lowell, where I worked for the past six or for about six and a half years in uh, undergraduate admissions as a regional recruiter in the New York area. Um, And then sometime during the pandemic, I ended up uh, moving over to Penn State, which has been quite exciting. Penn State is really something that is very, it's a university that's very unique in a lot of ways. Uh, But in any case, I really love working with students and families and helping them through this college process. I know it can be stressful. I've been through this with my own children. And uh, if any way I can make it a more fun and manageable process, I'm happy to do that. Well, welcome again. We are so happy to have you, Lori. Thank you so much. And I have to mention, when I visited Penn State University myself with my own family, I remember a woman who was working in the stadium. And during our tour, we went to the stadium, and she was lovely. She shared with us that her husband had graduated from Penn State, her three sons graduated from Penn State, and at the time, her first grandchild was a freshman at Penn State University. She was lovely. She gave us a tour of the stadium, which, by the way, we walked into it. It was just us. And you could feel the roar, the passion uh, that that stadium must produce at any given football game. I mention this because she talked about the tradition, the camaraderie, the sense of family. So what is it about Penn State University, in addition to all of those great things, that makes it appealing for a student to want to apply? So I I think Penn State really offers the best of all worlds. I I mean, we are a top tier one research university. You can get involved in cutting edge research as early as freshman year in every academic area. We are leaders in many different academic fields. We offer over 275 different majors. Uh, There are some really unique programs. There are some programs that are 
would be really interesting to students if they even realized that they were there. I always encourage students to check out our website and really explore the different offer uh, possibilities that we offer because there are some things that combine different interests that students, when they realize, they're like, I didn't even realize that was something I could study. So um, I think that just the choices that students have in academic programs. We also offer over 1,200 different clubs and activities. 95% of our students are involved in these clubs and, act and activities. So they really are, it's a very engaged, vibrant life on campus. And um, our students really do love to get involved. It is such a great way. Penn State is a very large university. We do have 46,000 undergraduate students just on our main campus. We actually have 20 different campuses throughout the state. But um, the way to make that large campus feel smaller is through the different clubs and organizations that students get involved with, through their majors, um, and through the, you know, their residential halls. Um, so that, those things combined with a really unrivaled school spirit um, just is it's the best of all possible worlds. And one thing that really makes Penn State unique is that we do have the largest alumni network in the entire world. We have over 700,000 active alumni those wow. alumni reach out um, and offer to be mentors for our students that are interested in their particular fields. Um, so it's just, there is a definite camaraderie. If you're a Penn Stater, you're a Penn Stater, and there's just that bond and that connection. So despite the fact that it's a large university, you've just got that, that bond and connection and uh, that on top of really incredible academic opportunities. Yes, and that's something that came through and through when we visited with my own family a couple of years back. So let me ask you, just how many applications do you receive each year? And if you could give us a little bit of insight in terms of how do you evaluate so many? So I believe this year for the entire university, um, we received like 120,000 applications. Wow. I think for the students that were putting University Park as their first choice, it was close to 90,000 applications. Um, I think from my specific region, I had close to... Uh, maybe 11,000 applications. Um, I read a fraction of those. It's, it would just not be possible for me to read all of them, but um, we do have an incredible team of people that do evaluate applications. Um, I would say I read maybe, you know, six to 800 of the applications. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, you know, there are many things that go into your college application. Uh, for any school, this is going to be the same. The first and foremost thing that we are considering is your GPA, your academic record. I think in years past, I would say the second thing we were looking at would be your test scores. Uh, Penn State has been test optional since the pandemic began. We had not been prior to the pandemic, although there are a growing number of schools that had been going test optional prior to the pandemic, but um, that definitely speeded up the process. And we are remaining test optional through at least next year. I believe we're hoping to kind of reevaluate after that and decide whether to continue being test optional or not, but um, in the past, that would have been the second thing we considered. For students who don't submit test scores, we will just place a higher value on your academic record. So we're looking at um, you know, your, the grades that you received in the classes that you took, the level of difficulty of your classes. We're always you know, interested in knowing that you challenged yourself. Uh, we are looking at you know, subject-specific tests. If you're interested in engineering, for instance, we're certainly going to be looking at your math and science grades a little bit more closely. Uh, so that's, the, again, the main thing that we are looking at. And then there are many other factors. Um, oftentimes, they're more like tiebreakers because we have, let's say, many students that are similarly qualified and we can't take all of them. And so that's where all of these other factors come into place. Hey, John, this is Abby from Penn State. Dormify is my go-to for all things small space decor, but my absolute favorite product is their Sutton Charging three-drawer cart on wheels. It is the perfect height for my lofted dorm bed, which adds the extra charging ports to my room, which I really needed. The additional plug-in drawers make my dorm so much cleaner, and it's all on wheels. It's a perfect addition to my room, and I couldn't recommend it enough. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Abby, for introducing Dormify to our listeners. Dormify is a one-stop shop for stylish and functional dorm decor, offering a wide range of stylish and functional products for anyone looking to decorate their dorms or small spaces. From bedding to wall decorating to storage solutions, 
Domify has everything you need to transform your living space into a comfortable and stylish home away from home. Use our exclusive coupon code College Talk. That's one word, College Talk, to save fifteen percent on most products when you shop at Domify.com or through the link provided in the show notes. Please note that if you make a purchase through the affiliate link or coupon code provided, the podcast will receive a small commission from Dormify. But rest assured, we would only promote products that we truly believe in and think will benefit our listeners. And now, back to the show. That's terrific. And I was very curious, the fact that you're test optional, how does that affect financial aid on the merit side? Does not at all. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't say that Penn State is overly, you know, um, we're not overly generous with merit aid. Unfortunately, we do have some merit aid opportunities. It is not at all based on SAT or ACT scores. Um, it's, you know, as a test optional university, we're evaluating you on what you submit to us for both admission and scholarships. Um, but uh, as far as, um, and, and it does not impact the admissions decision at all. I mean, what I recommend is for, since we are test optional, we're not test blind, which would mean we're not looking at them at all, we're test optional. So if your test scores benefit you, if, if you have test scores that are stronger than your GPA or as strong, then absolutely submit them. It, it could definitely help you to have very strong test scores. On the other hand, if your academic record is much stronger than your test scores, do not submit them. We'll place the greater emphasis on your academic record um, and it will not negatively impact your application at all. I would say we had the same percentage of students admitted without test scores as applied without test scores. And the best way to figure out where you fit is to check out any university is going to publish their middle 50% ranges. And so what I recommend is look at the middle 50% ranges, see where you fall as far as your GPA, see where you fall as far as your test scores go. If you're higher up in the GPA range, maybe you don't need to submit your test scores. Another thing to keep in mind is uh, I wouldn't say it's vastly different, but we definitely have seen a an upgrade in the in the numbers, I guess, of our test scores because the only people submitting test scores, for the most part, um, are students with stronger test scores. Occasionally, we do have students that don't have really strong test scores that don't really believe that test optional won't hurt them, and they submit their test scores, which is honestly a mistake because they can hurt you. So, truly, look at the middle fifty percent ranges if you're having trouble. We are very accessible people, admissions counselors, and while I maybe am not allowed to tell you yes, do submit, or no, don't submit, I can certainly help guide you. So reach out to admissions counselors. They're happy to talk to you and to help you figure out the best way to navigate their specific admissions process. I appreciate that, and you made reference a few times to the middle 50%, which is a great segue into my next question, what is the average profile of the current freshman class in terms of their GPA and any other related materials? So um, at Penn State, there's University Park, our main campus, and then we have our 19 other campuses that we call our Commonwealth campuses. So when you apply to Penn State, we ask that you tell us your first choice campus, and then we also ask for you to put a second choice campus. We will first evaluate you for your first choice campus. If we're not able to offer you admission to our your first choice campus, we will then offer you admission to uh, your second choice campus. We have a program called the 2 plus 2 program, which guarantees any student who applies to Penn State and is admitted to one of our Commonwealth campuses the opportunity to transition over to University Park for their second two years to complete their major. So it's not a transfer. It's not something you have to apply to. Um, you can start any major on any campus. The majority of majors do need to be completed at University Park. So about half of our students will start and finish at University Park or start and finish at one of our Commonwealth campuses. And about 50% of our students participate in this 2 plus 2 program. As far as the middle 50% ranges go, um, for University Park, the middle 50% GPA is about a 356 to a 391. Now, middle 50% is just that. We have 25% of our students that are above these ranges. 25% of our students are below these ranges. Some programs are more competitive than others, so chances are the nursing students, the business students, the engineers might be on the higher end. 
um, but not necessarily, not always. Every year it really depends on the applicant pool in any program. Um, but just to keep in mind, those are how the ranges go. For our Commonwealth campuses, the range is about a 3.06 to a 365. So definitely much less competitive to start out at our Commonwealth campuses, but you still have that pathway to the main campus if that's your ultimate goal. Um, as far as SATs go, the range for University Park, the middle 50% was 1280 to 1450, um, and the middle 50% for the Commonwealth campuses was 1090 to 1300. Um, ACT was 29 to 33 for University Park, and 23 to 30 for all the other campuses. So that's great information. And just to repeat, if you're not accepted outright to University Park, there is the opportunity to attend one of the other 19 campuses, and you have the 2 plus 2 program where you would begin the first two years at one of the satellite campuses. I think you said there are 19 of them. Right. And that guarantees you in years three and four that you would be at University Park. So that's great information for students out there that might fall you know, slightly below where they want to be. Uh, so thank you for that. No, you're welcome. There's definitely, a, I was going to say, a pathway. And one thing that I do like to mention about the 2 plus 2 program is that generally speaking, when you do attend one of the campuses, you're going to find your friends and form your friend groups on that campus. And about half of your friends are also participating in the 2 plus 2 program. So when you do make that transition over to University Park, you're not going by yourself generally. You're going with a whole large crowd of friends that you already have, and you're going to then Oops, expand your horizons and meet a whole other set of, of new friends once you transition, but you're still going to have that kind of safety net of a group that you're moving with. So I, I like to point that out because that, you know, thought of transitioning or, tra you know, changing campuses might be a little scary, but that makes it really, really manageable. And that's a great point. They're already making friends at one of those satellite campuses if that's where they need to begin and then they could transition to University Park together. I love that. A lot of students don't just start, um, it, it's not necessarily always an academic reason. For some students, they wanna maybe be a little bit closer to home. I mean, we have a couple of campuses right outside Philly, easy train ride to New York City, um, you know, smaller, much smaller campuses. So for some students, they like the idea of the big campus, but maybe as their transition into college life, they wanna start a little bit smaller, a little bit closer to home, and then have the option of, of making that move. Another excellent point, and I think something that's really important for students to recognize, do they want the big campus? Do they want to be close to home? Do they want to be, are they okay with being far away from home? These are questions that may seem insignificant, but they're really extremely important. So again, great insight, great advice. I appreciate it. One of the other things that Penn State University offers is rolling admissions, something that not necessarily every other school offers. Could you just unpackage that a little bit for us and explain what that all means? Absolutely. So there are three different ways that you can, um, or I should say two different ways that you can apply to Penn State. You can either apply early action, uh, which is applying by our November 1st deadline, and you hear by December 24th, um, but you don't have to let us know until May 1st whether or not you want to accept your offer. That is by far the best way to apply to Penn State. We accept a lot of students uh, in our early action pool. Once we make those offers, we have fewer offers to make. So while we do have rolling admissions, which means you can apply as late as June or July, as long as we have spots, we'll take you, but I don't recommend it. Um, the chances of you getting your first choice campus are significantly decreased the later you apply, even for top students. So the best thing you can do for Penn State if you want to get your first choice is to apply by our early action deadline of November 1st. I, I do want to point out that Penn State is a little bit different than many other schools in that we don't require uh, an official high school transcript until you have been admitted and accept your offer. We're gonna base our admissions decisions on your self-reported academic record, also known as your SRAR. So when you complete that application, if you go on the Common App and you submit your application by our deadline of November 1st, you are not done. We will give you a grace period of a few days, but, and so I usually tend tell students, 
don't wait till November 1st. Try to do it earlier because you're then going to get an email uh, telling you to set up a portal and fill out your SROR, which might take you a little bit of time. It's, it's not hard, but it does require a little bit of time and thought. You do need to have your transcript handy to be able to fill it all out. Um, and until we get that piece, you are, your application is not considered complete. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But again, we will accept uh, you know, applications throughout. Uh, we have a, the largest number of our applications are early action. Then we have our November pool of applications where uh, a lot of it is students that just applied late or didn't complete their SOAR in time. And then we do still, I've gotten a few applications even this week. The, you know, the options won't be as great, however. I appreciate that, and I'm going to ask you to repeat the self-reported academic record again because it, it's not common in every school. I do know that many others do use it, but someone might have given a double take when they heard you say, we don't look at the transcript. We look at what you, the student, reports on your application. So if you could just repeat that for the parents and the students listening in, please. Absolutely. So we are we're going to base our decisions on your self-reported academic record. You're going to go set up a portal. There are a few other universities that do use the SRAR. We're not the only ones, but um, I would not say we're in the majority. However, you uh, fill out your self-reported academic record. Basically, you're going to tell us all of the classes that you took, years 9 through 11, the grades you received in those classes, and we're also looking at your senior year schedule. We don't use your senior year grades. We've made most of our decisions before you even get them, but we are looking to see that you're continuing to challenge yourself senior year. We ask for the transcript. If you decide, if we make you an offer and you decide, yes, we're, I'm going to attend Penn State, that's when we ask for the transcript and we just confirm everything that you have told us. Um, I get calls all the time. Somebody submitted their SRAR and then they decided they're going to change a class or drop a class. It's generally not a problem unless it's a required class for something you're applying to. Um, but it's good to let us know so it's in your file that you made a change. Uh, but that's why. So we, we you know, definitely we're, we're using your transcript, but you're just filling it out for us and we're just confirming it after the fact. But that all has to be in and complete for your application to be considered complete. The same thing with test scores. We are test optional, but if you tell us I'm going to submit my test scores and we don't have them, your application is not considered complete. So um, if you are planning to submit test scores, make sure that they are in by our deadline. Great. Thank you so much for that. Do you conduct on-site interviews with prospective students? And if so, what advice would you give them in terms of their preparation? So we do not um, offer interviews at all. I will happily meet with students. I'll set up a Zoom call. I'll set up a phone call. So I'm happy to talk to students, but it, you know they're not evaluative interviews. And I will say just from my experience as a volunteer for my own alma mater, um, doing this, most of the t many of the schools that offer interviews, not all, but many of them are through alumni or even sometimes if you go to campus, they're with current students, maybe seniors working in the admissions office, um, and they're mostly informational. So, you know, occasionally they can be a little bit evaluative. Maybe you'll fill out a form and just say, you know, give your opinions of the, the candidate. Um, I don't know. I don't think they really are weighing very heavily in the decision. Um, but it's a great opportunity to show your interest. It's a great opportunity to get some questions answered to, from a different perspective. Um, so I think, you know, there are certain questions that you should be prepared to answer, tell, you know, be able to talk about yourself, be able to talk about your, uh, you know, achievements that you're proud of, maybe any obstacles you've overcome, talk about the community that you come from, what, you know, high, type of high school did you come from, um, and then to ask you know, appropriate questions. I would not recommend asking questions that you can easily find on a website. Um, this is your opportunity. Um, when I advise students who are going on interviews like this, I say, you know, ask if it's an alumni, ask, how was your experience? What, what are things that you are so glad that you did while you were there? What are things that you wish you had done? Um, what would you do differently? So questions like that, um, as opposed to, you know, can a freshman have a car on campus or <laughs> how's your psychology department? Like those are things that, you know, go onto the website, do your research, you know, here you've got this golden opportunity to have somebody to ask a question that you're not going to be able to get an answer otherwise. So what are some examples of college essays that really stuck out with you? Are there any that you could share with us? I think the thing 
that stands out the most is just it's your opportunity to speak to me directly. And some of the essays that I've read are, have not been about any overwhelming experiences, nothing exotic or, you know, it's just like every day your life. So I, you know, definitely, um, I, I've seen, I saw a student wrote an essay, of, you know, her parents were divorced and she put such a positive spin on it. I, I was so struck by it, talking about how she has this great opportunity to live in these two different worlds and how all the great things she does in this world and all the great things she does in that world. And I think what I came away with from that was just that what a positive outlook this person has. Um, I've read uh, about daily commutes, you know, students that live in the city that take the subway to school and just the different things they see along the way and their perspective on things. So nothing out of the ordinary. Um, one, you know, I did read about a student um, that I almost was in tears as I was reading it. Um, she had been adopted from China and just um, had to, the opportunity to go like learn more about her history and just the fact that, you know, it's so serendipitous that she ended up where she was with the family she was and how grateful she was. And I mean, that is something that doesn't happen to everybody, but it was really an outstanding essay. Um, but, you know, again, it, it some of the best ones I've read have been very simple, very straightforward. I think the key is I want to get to know you. So I've read many about grandparents and grandparents are really wonderful we all love grandparents um if you're writing about how your grandparent impacted you how you do certain things because of this influence that's great but again your grandparents not applying you are so i definitely want to be hearing about you and um you know the same thing there are some essays that you know a lot of a lot of sports essays a lot of it's fine to write about what's whatever it is that's really impactful to you if you're writing about something that you're involved in i i see your resume so i don't need to hear a laundry list of what you're involved in however if there's one particular thing that really inspires you maybe it's something that you want to ultimately study maybe it's not maybe it's just something that will always be an extracurricular passion but you are really passionate about it and want to go into more detail, that's great as well. So don't stress over it. We're, you know, not looking to catch you up. I mean, I think the key is that we are admissions officers. We're not rejection officers. We're looking for reasons to accept you. Um, we want to accept you. So we're just really trying to get to know you and, uh, you know, make us remember you when we're looking at several applications and they're similar and like, oh, that was, that really stood out to me. So... And I think that's key, what you just said, in terms of admissions officers really want to get to know you students. So if you're using your essay to repeat what's already on your application, it's really not going to help. I think it's very important after you submit your essay or after you complete your essay that you ask yourself, is there something new that the reader of this essay is going to learn about me? And if the answer is yes, in terms of giving a little bit more insight about your personality or who you are as a person, then I would say that that's a good essay. So great advice. Thank you again, Lori. I appreciate it. In terms of teacher letters of recommendations, what are you looking for to help get you a better picture of the candidate? And again, do you have any examples? So I, I want to just point out that Penn State does not require um, recommendations. We do require them for our honors college and some other special programs that we offer, but general admissions, we don't require them. That being said, when I'm reading an application, I read everything in the file and I do read the teacher recommendations. And a lot of times um, I tend to find the counselor recommendations to be the most helpful. Um, sometimes the teacher recommendations are great, particularly when they're talking about how a student helps everybody in the class and is always the first one to, you know, ask questions. Maybe the student struggled in the class, but they really, they came to extra help every day. They asked questions. They persevered. Those are really helpful to, to hear, you know, to get a repeat of what, again, what you have um, listed in your application activities that you're involved in or the grades you received in that class. Um, are not overly helpful just because I have all that information. So anything that, you know, again, we get a lot of applications, we read a lot of applications, we don't have a lot of time to read the applications. So you want to make sure that anything that you submit is going to give us maybe a different picture than we've already gotten in other aspects of your application. So, you know, sometimes a student will have a teacher that they also had for an activity as an advisor. So the 
teacher maybe got to know them two different ways. That's always really helpful. Um, it doesn't have to be the class that you did the best in. Sometimes just reaching out to the, the teacher that you really just connect with for whatever reason is, is a great, you know, uh, will make for a great recommendation. The counselor recommendation is also a great way for you to get information to us that uh, maybe explaining a special circumstance or situation that you didn't put elsewhere in the application. There are places for you to list those things on the application. There is uh, a place for additional information, both COVID related, non COVID related. But um, sometimes I'll read an essay or I'll read a whole application and then I read the counselor letter and I'm like, oh my goodness, like, I can't believe this ch this student has been dealing with all of this and never anywhere in this application did they mention all of these things that they've gone through. And so, or sometimes I won't even see a complete resume for whatever reason, which is not a good thing. Definitely submit your, fill out the common app, put all your activities in, but I won't see much about that. And then I'll hear all about some incredible thing that a student is involved in through their counselor recommendation. So it's basically the best thing I'm getting out of it is to get a little bit more of an insight into your character and just to learn a little bit something of, that I didn't already learn from your uh, other things in your application. Great advice. And again, it just goes to show that whether it's a teacher letter of recommendation or if a student writes their own essay, of course, to provide something new for you to learn. And I just want to make a comment to the students that if you're asking a teacher, and I get it, Penn State is saying you don't have to submit letters of recommendations, but if you are asking a teacher to submit a letter of recommendation and there's something specific that happened, you led a group to bring some idea to fruition, you came up with a fundraiser that ultimately the club came together and and worked on. Ask the teacher to write about those things. If the teacher writes that you're part of the investment club, they already know that. So what you're really looking for students is for the teachers to also add something new to the total application, just like that's what you need to do when you're writing your own essay. So Lori, again, thank you for that insight. How often should a student visit the campus and do you keep track of such things? Such a great question. Um, we technically do not track interest. That being said, we track interest. because Everybody tracks interest. We know every time you open an email, we know every time you contact us, whether it's by phone, whether it's by email, um, and we do know when you visited campus. So we certainly encourage students to visit campus. I mean, I tell students to go visit several campuses, not even the ones you're applying to necessarily, to get a sense of, what type of campus you like. However, um, you know, it certainly, it, you know, we love to see that you visited campus, but we also understand that it's not always easy to get to campus. You guys are busy, you're involved in a zillion different things, your weekends are filled, your weeks are filled. We totally understand that. So um, while I certainly encourage you to visit, because I think it's a, an important part of the college application process, um, we, we won't hold it against you if you don't visit. And actually, I would highly recommend taking advantage of all the virtual opportunities there are to visit. Never before has there been so much opportunity to engage virtually. So, you know, a, a school is not going to, even schools that do track interest and do track your visits, they'll understand that you didn't physically get to campus, but you should take advantage of the virtual information session or the virtual student tour or, you know, many other virtual programs. I mean, I, we offer them for our different academic colleges. We offer them for some of our resources like career services, study abroad. So I definitely recommend taking advantage of the virtual visits. And if you can visit, absolutely. Um, so again, while we don't use that as part of our decision making, I can only speak for myself when I'm reading an application and I know that the student has reached out to me in a positive way, expressed their interest, asked relevant questions that they couldn't find on the website. Um, I can't help, but you know, we all like to be liked. So if I know, if I have one precious spot and several students, the one that has really expressed their interest is just going to naturally stand out to me, all things being equal otherwise. How do you evaluate varying state assessments for example, New York State has Regents exams for all students, and of course, Penn State is in Pennsylvania. So how do 
regents exams come into play for those students applying from the state of New York? So they don't. Um, the, we look at the grades that you receive in the classes that you take. So your regents classes, it's the same thing even for your AP classes. We're really only looking at the grades that you receive in the actual class. Um, as far as we don't use the regents grades or the AP or IB grades in, you know, test grades in our evaluation, just the grades you receive in the classes. As far as regions, obviously, is not going to, you're not going to do anything with those grades, but certainly if you took AP classes, uh, that will be something that you would use to get credit once you're admitted, but it's not part of your evaluation. What kind of scholarship opportunities do you offer for academic achievement, and does a student have to apply separately, or is it part of the overall application process? So um, I wouldn't say that Penn State has an un abundance of merit scholarships. We do offer need-based aid, and we have some merit scholarships. There are a very few, um, and they're based, it's a very holistic approach to um, reviewing them so for students for our, like, let's say our provost award. Uh, so there are some but it's not many. There also are some scholarship opportunities through our different academic colleges. So if you're applying to engineering or business or liberal arts, or even if you're undecided, there are some specific scholarships that you can go onto our website and look up and that you do have to apply for them. So you want to be aware of deadlines. You want to be, so as you're going through this, don't wait until, you know, I, there are, some of the deadlines are before you would have to let us know that you're even coming. So you definitely want to be on top of that. Um, but yeah, there are some, and a lot of them are for you to reach out. Penn State happens to be more generous with merit scholarships for upperclassmen. Um, rather than helping you get there in the first place, we want to make sure you stay there. We have a very high graduation rate. We have a really high retention rate. We want to keep it that way. So we put more of our resources into rewarding our students that are already there and doing well in their different programs. That's great to know. Thank you so much. And lastly, Lori, what other advice would you offer prospective students and their parents who are starting the process now? So have fun with it is my first piece of advice. I did this with my own three children. I really enjoyed the process, though it was stressful and though it is overwhelming. Um, you know, there are two factors. You're looking for uh, a good academic fit. You're looking for, you're worried about what colleges are looking for in you, but you're also worried about what you're looking for in colleges. So keep an open mind. I recommend trying to narrow down by thinking about size and location. How far are you willing to go? Are you willing to get on a plane to go to school? Do you want to be in a four-hour driving radius? Um, and sometimes it's hard to know as far as size goes. Sometimes you think you want big and you get there and it's not right, or you think you want small and you get to a school that's super small and you think, I, this would be, I'd outgrow this too soon. So you really want to give that some thought and you have, you don't have to necessarily visit the schools that you're planning to apply to, to get a sense. I mean, right here on Long Island, you can get to Stony Brook, you can get to Hofstra, you can get to CW. I mean, there's plenty of schools right here that you can you go into New York City to see if you like an urban environment, or do you want to be in the suburbs, or do you want to be in a real rural environment? So, you, you know, just try to narrow down the factors to make this less, uh, this process less overwhelming. Keep an open mind. You don't necessarily have to go to the school that all your friends are going to. Uh, there are so many great schools out there, and you can really do very well at any one of them. So worry about what really is a good fit for you, both academically and socially and all the other things that are important to you. Kind of take a, make a list of things that are important to you and, and the factors that you really want to consider when you're looking at schools. Keep a spreadsheet if possible. Every school is, has similarities, but they also have differences. Differences in deadlines, application plans, priorities that they're looking for. So I recommend having a spreadsheet, keeping track of what you know, what different deadlines each school has, how many recommendations, if any, the school requires. You don't want to send too many. You don't want to send too few. So just try to be organized um, as, as best as you can. And again, have fun with the process. It, it really does all work out. There are so many great schools out there. And sadly, you can only choose one. <laughs> well, that's tremendous advice. And I love the keep the spreadsheet because you're right there are so many differences between the schools that students have to choose from including Penn State we talked about 20 campuses we talked about rolling admissions and so much more so keeping track as Lori said 
of the different aspects of each school that you're applying to, the different deadlines is so important. Laurie, this was terrific. I cannot thank you enough. The amount of information that you gave to all of the students and the parents that are listening in uh, on behalf of everyone, we really appreciate it. And it was a true honor uh, to have you here as a guest today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.